Hi everyone, welcome to the study of El Elyon in our Names of God series. When I taught this unit live at our church, I taught El Elyon and Jehovah Sabaoth and Jehovah Nisi as one unit. And that's because all three of those names have military connotations. Um, you'll see that as we flesh it out more. But the overarching theme is one of warfare. And we have to remember that we, as believers, and all humans, are in a battle. We're in a battle against sin, against ourselves, and against Satan. Okay, there is spiritual warfare that's happening all the time behind the scenes. We don't always pay attention to it. We don't always think about it. It's not something that's pleasant or enjoyable to spend time on, but it's happening. We like to, to say when we hit a, a snag in life or if we run up on a struggle that Satan's attacking us and that there's spiritual warfare happening, but the truth is it's happening all the time, even when we're happy, even sometimes especially when we're happy. That can be Satan's attack because he's keeping us placated so that we won't pursue the Lord. And so we have to re redirect our brains to understand that there is a real war going on. We can't see it because it's in the supernatural realm, but it's real and we are being affected by it. And we also have a part to play in it. And so as we think about that war that we're in, we are going to find great comfort in these three names, El Elyon, Jehovah Sabaoth, and Jehovah Nisi, because the Lord is in the battle with us. And these are the names that, that he revealed in scripture for that purpose. So I hope that you will listen to these three videos um, in succession with one another so that you will get the big picture of what God is trying to tell us about himself here. Um, but for now, we're just going to take a look at El Elyon. So the L part of El Elyon, the L, and then there's Elyon. So L was a term that was used in many cultures during biblical times to, to refer to um, a nation's deity. Okay, so it didn't necessarily mean Yahweh. It could mean any God, lowercase g, that the peoples were talking about. It um, was used over 230 times in scripture, and it's just a term that expresses majesty and power. It's an idea that, that this God or this being or this whatever we're talking about is very majestic and very powerful. Um, when applied to God, the El Yon part of it, this is one of your blanks, when applied to God, El Yon, meaning highest or exalted one, emphasizes that God is the highest in every realm of life. He's the highest in every realm of life. We're going to see how that plays out um, in a minute. It was first revealed in the interaction with that Abram had with Melchizedek because Melchizedek was called the priest of God Most High, the priest of El Elyon. So we're going to talk about that more in detail in a minute. Um, the name or the term Elyon, just like some other names that we talked about earlier, like Elohim, can be used to talk about other things besides Yahweh. When you see Elyon with a little e, if you read Hebrew scriptures, you could see it with a little e. It just means something that's the highest in an order of things. Okay, so there are a couple of examples um, that come to mind in scripture. One is the account of Joseph when he was in prison with the chief baker. He had a dream. And he had a dream that he was walking along with several baskets on top of his head. And the birds started picking the, the bread out of the top of the basket, of the top basket, right? And so Joseph interprets the dream and says that his head is going to be picked off. And, and so that in, ends up being what happens. But the term for top basket in that phrase is El Yon. So that is literally referencing the one that was on the very, very top. El, the El Yon basket. So our God is the Elyon God, meaning he is the most high over all the gods. Now we know that there aren't actually other gods. There aren't real other gods. But in the time that the Israelites lived, it's a very common belief that there were multiple gods. And so Israel had to define who their God was, and he was the most high one. Okay. Um, Elyon is revealed for the first time in Genesis 14. This is the account of Abram having to go rescue Lot 
a bunch of kings, Lot had moved to Sodom and Gomorrah in that area, and a bunch of kings from, from nearby had come to, to take over Sodom and Gomorrah to capture all of their people to take them back to their land. And so Abram and 300 of the servants that were from his household had to go and rescue Lot and the other people from Sodom and Gomorrah and bring them back home. Um, the king of Sodom meets Abram on his way back and offers him um, some of the spoil of the war, a reward for, for rescuing all the people. But Abram says to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand to Yahweh, El Elyon, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. So what does this mean? Well, this is kind of a weird interaction. And it's a weird way, it seems, that God would be revealing his name. But what we have to think about is right before that interaction with the king of Sodom, Abram had just met with Melchizedek, the king of Salem, um, who's also called priest of the Most High. He's the only example of both, both a priest and a king in the same person until we get to Jesus. And Jesus is also a priest and a king. And so there are many people who believe that Melchizedek is actually a pre-incarnate Jesus who's shown up to talk to Abraham in person, which puts a whole nother spin on this story, but we're not gonna focus on that today. So Melchizedek is called the, the priest of El Elyon, the priest of the Most High. And this is what happens with Abram and Melchizedek. Um, the king of Salem had, had met Abram, and Abram had made an offering to Melchizedek. Abram gave him a tenth of everything that he had. Okay, that's the first tithe. Okay, that's another, another first that shows up in these early scriptures. And so... Um, Genesis 14, 19, and 20 says this, Blessed be Abram by El Elyon. This is Melchizedek speaking. Blessed be Abram by El Elyon, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be El Elyon, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. So this right here is the first time that El Elyon is used in scripture. It occurs a total of 40 times in the Old Testament. Pagan kings at that time believed that that they won or lost battles based on whose country's gods were, were more powerful. So in the example we just talked about where the kings, the, the kings of the nations nearby had come to defeat Sodom and Gomorrah, they were thinking that their gods were more powerful than whatever gods Sodom and Gomorrah worshipped. Well, then Abram comes in with his 300 men and rescues all of the captives from those kings and takes them home. And so in a real sense to the people of that culture, they would look at Abram and say, his God is higher than the kings who, who attacked and then the gods who of Sodom and Gomorrah. He is the highest. He is the El Yon God of all the gods, simply because Abram won a victory. A victory. So pagan, pagan kings would look at Abram and say, your God is higher than our God. Your God is the Elion God. So Melchizedek knew that he spoke on good authority when he said Abram served the most high God, the Elion, because his God had just won the victory. He had defeated everybody else and all of their gods, right? And so that's kind of where we get the military connotation. God revealed himself to Abram as El Elyon in a moment of victory. And at the moment of final victory, when Christ conquers Satan once and for all, the saints of God and everyone else who doesn't serve Jesus will look at heaven and exclaim that El Yon, Yahweh, is greater than anyone else or any other power. He is truly the most high God, El Elyon. He is the highest, whether people want to acknowledge it or not. Okay, so we talked about, um, when we talked about Yahweh, we talked about the fact that God is who he is, 
take it or leave it. You know, I am what I am. I am who I am. I am that I am. Take it or leave it. And we have to get comfortable with the fact that God is who he is, not who we make him out to be. And so God is literally the highest there is, the highest God, the highest being, the highest power that there can be. There's nothing higher than him. We don't have to believe that for it to be true. A lot of people don't believe it, but it doesn't make it true. It doesn't make it not true. He is the highest. And if you aren't willing to bow a knee to the highest being, then you are going to have to bow one at the final judgment. And that's not going to go well for you. Um, your next blank is El Elyon is sovereign over everything and everyone and can command them to do his will. He's sovereign over everything and everyone, and he can command them to do his will. So what does sovereign mean? Sovereign simply just means supreme in power and superior to all others. It means God can do what he wants, right? He has the most power to do anything that he wants to do. Because God is the most high, the El Yon, he owns everything in creation. He is in charge of all of it. And we remember from Elohim that he owns it because he created it. It's his to begin with because he made it. So it's easy to see how God can control every situation of our lives because he owns the universe. He is in charge of everything in it. And so he can move things around however he wants to, to accomplish whatever he wants to. Um, a really interesting example of this, kind of an extreme, dream example, um, is in Daniel chapter four. It's the account of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. He, um, in this part, had become very um, impressed with himself. We'll just say he was standing out on his balcony and looking out over his kingdom and, and telling himself how wonderful he was and how um, all all people have to do what he says and bow to him and that he owns all this property and he conquered all these things all by himself and he didn't have any help from anybody. And, and God just kind of gets tired of hearing it. God ended up showing him clearly that it was not the case. God caused Nebuchadnezzar to go insane, literally insane. He caused him to act like an animal and eat grass for seven years, seven years, Nebuchadnezzar left his palace, he thought he was an animal, and he went and lived in the woods for seven years and ate grass. His hair grew out, he looked crazy, he had talons for fingernails, he was, he was crazy. God touched his mind and turned him insane for seven years to show him that he wasn't in control of anything, not even himself. But then after the seven years, Nebuchadnezzar decided to acknowledge that God was the one who owned everything and gave him everything in his kingdom. And at the end of those seven years, Nebuchadnezzar came to his senses, and this is what he said. I praised El Elyon. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of earth. No one can hold back his hand. Nebuchadnezzar's experience illustrates what happens when human beings forget who is highest in heaven and earth. Now again, that's an extreme example. God's probably not going to turn you into a mule and have you go eat grass. Okay, that's probably not what's going to happen. But... <laughs> God has every right and every power to knock you on your rear end if you get too proud of yourself. If you turn a, a blind eye to the Lord and you start thinking that everything that's good in your life comes from you and that you are the master of your own fate and you don't answer to anybody, God is well within his rights and his ability to set you straight in whatever way he needs to set you straight. And really, you don't get to be mad about that. You don't. Because you should be honoring and serving El Yon. El El Yon, the Most High God, out of reverence. 
you should be remembering that he's the one who's in control of everything and you are in control of nothing. Nothing. If God is not sovereign, this is another one of your blanks. If God is not sovereign, if he is not in control, if all things are not under his dominion, then he is not the most high. And you and I are either in the hands of fate, whatever that is, <laughs> or the hands of man, no thank you, or in the hands of the devil. I'll choose the first option, thanks. I'll be ruled by El Elyon, thank you very much. So what difference does it make in our lives to remember that El Elyon is the most high, okay? That God is sovereign, that he's ruler over all the things, that nothing can happen without his ultimate sanction or permission. Isaiah 14 verses 24 and 27 say this, Jehovah Sabaoth has sworn, surely as I have planned, so it will be, and as I have purposed, so it will stand. For Jehovah Sabaoth has purposed and who can thwart him? His hand is stretched out, and who can turn it back? Now the name here is Jehovah Sabaoth, I understand that. But we remember that God is the same God when he reveals all of his names. It's still the same God. He is just as much Jehovah Sabaoth in a moment as he is El Elyon. He's also Yahweh and Elohim and El Shaddai and Adonai. He's all of the, the names that he's revealed at one time. And so this verse is saying that God makes plans and they happen. Okay, we make plans and sometimes they happen. And sometimes we have to change our plans because they can't happen. They can't work. Daniel 2 verses 21 and 22 say, He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. So that's telling us that El Elyon is, is in charge of seasons, time. We remember in scripture, he moved the sun back one time to make the day longer, right? Um, he, he can make the sun dark. He did that when Jesus died. The sun went dark. God is in charge of time. He's in charge of seasons. He's in charge of kings. He sets up kings. He takes them down. He's in charge of who's the president of the United States, okay? Every four years, we think we choose that, but really it's God. God is in charge of that. Deuteronomy 32, 39 tells us, it says, see now that I, even I, am he, and there is no Elohim besides me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. And so there we see that God is sovereign over life and death. He's sovereign over sickness. He's sovereign over health, okay? We, we like to think that all wounding comes from Satan and all healing comes from the Lord. But that's not true. Scripture says very clearly, I wound and I heal. So we have to get comfortable with the fact that sometimes God wounds us because we need to be wounded. Paul said God gave him a thorn in his side. We don't know if that was a physical ailment. We know that he had vision problems. It could have been that. It could have been any number of things. But God actively put, gave, Paul said, something that was wounding to him, to Paul. Because he had a purpose. He had a plan. And we don't know what that is. Paul never, never learned in this life that we know of. Maybe he knows now. Maybe the Lord decided to keep that as part of the mystery of his will. Paul still may not know why God did it, but he gave God glory for it, right? And so we need to be careful when we are looking at, you know, illness or hurt or pain in our own life. If we're going through hard times, you know, it can be real easy to just, you know, assume that that's Satan attacking us and that, you know, what we need is to be delivered from it. But Maybe God sent it your way. He let, he let Satan attack Job, right? He let Jonah get swallowed by a whale. He let Jesus die on a cross, <laughs> okay? 
All of those things were sanctioned by the Lord. All of them. Even Job, God didn't actively do the wounding, but he allowed Satan to do it. Satan had to ask his permission, and God said, okay, go ahead. <laughs> so, Elyon is sovereign, not only over the things that make us feel good, but over the things that hurt us too. And it would we would do well in those moments of, of pain and sorrow and struggle to look to him to say, Lord, what do you want me to learn from this? What do you want me to get out of this? Why have you sent this to me? And God may not tell you anything other than to worship me, to find joy in the midst of it, to, to give me honor and praise, even though life isn't fun, to show the world that God is worth worshiping, even if everything, you don't get everything you want, you know? And so God is the most high over life and death and wounding and healing. 1 Samuel 2, verses 7 and 8 and verse 10 say, Yahweh makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. For the pillars of the earth are Yahweh's, and on them he has set the world. The adversaries of Yahweh shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. Yahweh will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. So this is telling us that Yahweh is sovereign over powers and riches and positions in this life. He gets to decide who gets the promotion at work, who gets to be the boss. Again, who gets to be the president or the king or the governor or the mayor. You know, he's in charge of all of that. He puts people in those places of, of authority on purpose for a reason. And it's not always to bring us good. He allows rotten kings for the nation of Israel over and over and over again. He let them be. Like, that was a God thing. He allowed it. And the people suffered for it. But he had a plan and a purpose, right? And we don't know what all that is. But God's plan came to be. His, we talked about who he has plans. They always happen. So... So we have to get comfortable with the fact that God, El Yon, is sovereign over who has money and who doesn't. If you don't have the paycheck that you want, if you're working your fingers to the bone and you're doing everything that you're supposed to do and you're still, you know, just scraping by, it could be that God wants you in that place. Paul was in that place too. He said, I know what it's like to have a lot and I know what it's like to have nothing. You know? He was praising God in the middle of both situations. So God is in control of all the money in this world and he gives it to who he wants when he wants. And he's in charge of the powers and the rulers and the authorities of this world as well. Um, El Elyon rules supremely over all things. Because of that, because he rules, we can understand how all things work together for the good of those who love him. Okay. Of those who love him. Let me emphasize that. Scripture does not say that all, thing work, all things work together for the good. Mm -mm. If you don't belong to the Lord, you have no guarantee that all things are going to work together for your good. Your end result of this life is not good if you don't love the Lord. If you aren't following Jesus, Good is not waiting for you at the end, <laughs> okay? All things are not working together for that good. But if you do, if you love him, then he's working all things together, good and bad things, for good things for you, right? And it might be good things like learning humility or learning long-suffering <laughs> or learning patience, okay? Those are all good things. You learn those by practice. You don't learn those by reading about them. And how do you practice patience? By having to put up with something that you don't want to put up with. How do you practice humility? By having your pride broken, right? Long suffering, how do you practice that? By suffering long, <laughs> right? So El Yan, El El Yan is ruling supremely over all things. And he uses all things in the life of those who love him 
for their good, okay? It's easier to give thanks to our God, El Elyon, in the middle of those circumstances. James 1, consider it all joy when you encounter trials of various kinds. It's easier to have that joy when we remember that even those trials that we got have been sanctioned by the Lord. We remember that El Elyon, the God Most High, is in control of those things. And that nothing in this universe can happen without his permission. And so we can take comfort in that. Sometimes that's the only thing we can take comfort in, right? Sometimes life is just really bad. It's really bad. Everything is broken. There's nothing good to look out for. Nothing. <laughs> Everything's bad. Except the Lord. And even in the middle of the horrible parts of life, we can remember that God loves us. And he promised that he's working even those awful things for our good. And so we can rest in that and, and take joy in that one thing. If there's nothing else to be joyful about, we can take joy in that and trust him in that. Until we fully recognize God's sufficiency in this way and our insufficiency, remember El Shaddai, <laughs> we will never know him as El Elyon. By the point that Abram knew God as El Elyon in Genesis 14, he already had known him as El Shaddai. He already had discovered that, that God was the Most High and the owner of heaven and earth when he met with that king of Sodom, right? He, he, he repeated what Melchizedek had said to him, that he was, blessed be El Elyon, possessor of heaven and earth. That's what Abram said to the king of Sodom, that he served El Elyon, the possessor of heaven and earth. And he was refusing to look for resources for victory from anyone else. He didn't want anything that the king of Sodom had to offer. He was depending solely on the Lord for what he needed. He had learned his lesson. So the understanding that God is the possessor of the heavens and the earth gives us a basis for our faith in the midst of crisis or when we feel like we're in a battle or a struggle in our life. Because El Elyon is supreme commander of the universe. He rules it all. So not only does he lead us through the battle, through the struggle that we have in our life, but he's ultimately in control of how that battle goes, right? He gets to decide who wins. He gets to decide how the win happens. And if El Elyon can make the heavens and the earth, he can provide you with the necessities of life. And he can equip us with what we need to fight the battles in this life. So, a takeaway from El Elyon. Who is most high in your life? What is most high? Is it God? Is it El Elyon? Or is it your family? Is it your luxury? Your comfort? Is it your money? Is it your free time? What is it that you put the highest priority, the highest value on in your life? Or is it serving the Lord at all cost? You know, do you value what people think of you more than you value serving God? Then that's what's most high in your life, not El Elyon. Another takeaway that we've just talked about at length is when you're battling things in your life, when you're struggling, when you have a war that you're in the middle of, look to your El Elyon, pray specifically to him, remembering that he is the most high over all of the circumstances, over all of the people involved, over everything that you're dealing with, over every sickness, over every trial. He is the most high. And so he can maneuver things and people however he needs to, to provide a victory. Now, the victory may not be that you get what you want. <laughs> the victory may be you overcome sin in your life or fear in your life or you um, offer forgiveness that you weren't willing to offer before. There may be lots of other victories besides getting what you want. But El Elyon is the possessor of those victories and he is the one that can give those to you. 
And so pray to him, pray to El, El, El Elyon, knowing that he is the possessor, the owner, the ruler of the heavens and the earth and everything in them. And trust in him to give you what you need to fight those battles in this life. Have a great day.